came and uh, and spoke that the ministry of, of Lebanon is going to be like Joseph. His branches is going to go over the wall. And uh, we did not really understand that until we seen God just push us and open doors. And we were able to go to Egypt. God connected us with a man there that uh, turned out to be a key for the revival in Egypt. He was Egyptian, uh, hungry for God, and uh, we shared with him the oneness of God and the God in Christ. And God opened his eyes to the truth. He was baptized in Jesus' name with his wife. And, uh, you know, I want to tell you, you never know the person that you reach out to, the person that you testify to. You have no idea how God can take them, change their life, and send them. And I thank God that now we have a man in Egypt preaching the name of Jesus, baptizing folks in the name of the Lord. And we give God the glory. He's been uh, uh, doing great work. And pa last year, uh, well, the year before that, actually, I was, I was visiting a church in Arkansas out in the, in the rice fields and, uh, in a small town called Stuttgart. And there after service, a man came to me with the pastor and came to me and said, I've, I've felt in the Holy Ghost to give you this envelope. And so I opened the envelope and there was Iraqi money in it. And uh, I said, well, I appreciate that. I thought that we'll take the money to Lebanon, exchange it and use it in the field. He said he was a contractor there for several years and he had this money saved. And so anyway, went to Lebanon and tried to exchange the money and I couldn't. So I, nobody wanted the Iraqi money in Lebanon, so I put it in a drawer and uh, went on. Two weeks later, one of the brethren that we baptized in Lebanon went to Iraq. And, uh, and I, we baptized several throughout the years that came to our church and traveled throughout the Middle East. And uh, so he called me, said, Pastor, I've been here in Iraq for about seven months, and I have not found a church. And I was wondering if you can come and visit me. And so, you know, we, we're kind of comfortable in Lebanon, and, uh, but Iraq is a hot place for us. And so we, uh, as I prayed about it, felt impressed in the Holy Ghost to go. Yeah. And uh, so we looked up where he's at, found a hotel nearby, and uh, booked a ticket. And I said, well, you know, I'll just take, there's a direct flight from Beirut about an hour and a half to, to northern Iraq and come back. And uh, that week before I left, a friend of mine in Lebanon who is uh, in the army, had, I was visiting him and his wife was there and she asked me, aren't you afraid from going to Iraq? And I said, well, I mean, I, I do have some concerns, uh, but I, I prayed and I feel like God wants us to go. And so that friend of mine said, you know, I know a friend of mine that's a... Uh, uh, knows the son of the governor there. He got on the phone, called him, and sent him my itinerary. Little did I know, we got to Iraq, and there there is this bulletproof SUV and some security there waiting for me, and they were taking me everywhere. Felt like I owned the town. Amen. And, but what happened is I got to the hotel, and one night when the security weren't there, I walked, left the hotel and started walking in the streets in Iraq, I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel what God has for us. And um, I realized that God had already financed the trip by giving me that money in Arkansas to Iraq. So I was able to use it there. And as I walked to the streets, I felt a great burden. God spoke to me. He said, this is where I brought Abraham from, the Ur of Chaldeans. And this is where I want to bring a church from. And the presence of God was so overwhelming as I walked these streets of, of Iraq, came back to my hotel praying, uh, weeping in the presence of God. I knew that God wanted to do something. And you know, sometimes you just don't know how things are going to unfold. But I want to promise you that if you keep on keeping on, you will look back and say, God, you were here, you were here, you were there. And God will make everything come to pass. Amen. And so we took several trips, and, uh, and I wasn't planning on it, but by the grace of God, became resident of Iraq. Now I'm resident of Lebanon. And, and, uh, but God was setting things in motion for us, gave us favor. And I learned a long time ago that when the will of God comes, favor comes. Favor comes. When, 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 when you want to do something for the Lord, the first thing you want to look, favor. Amen. Because God starts opening doors and, and making things uh, move in, in that direction. And so anyway, uh, last year as, as I was praying and I said, God, we need a man on the ground that, uh, uh, and God laid a brother on, on my heart and from our church and I, I didn't talk to him. I said, God, if this is your man, you lay it on his heart to come and talk to me. And I prayed and I firmly believe that, that uh, I believe in pastoral 
authority. I believe that that God, when Amen, that God uses that tremendously. And so, it wasn't but a week later, this brother came, said, "Pastor, I feel a burden to go to Iraq. Uh, I want to go there, and I want to try to work the field." And we prayed, and God gave us confirmation. We we're able to send our first missionary from Lebanon to Iraq. <laughs> amen. And I, I thank God for that. He went, and he 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 took off, connected with people. And, uh, and I'm, I know I'm taking a little bit of time tonight, but uh, in October 7, my wife and I were in Redlands, California at a meeting. We just left Lebanon and went to that meeting. And when we were there that uh, Saturday, we heard the news that Hamas has broken into Israel. And uh, we knew of what has taken place. And I knew that things are going to escalate rapidly in the Middle East. And so we immediately canceled our church services and we booked a flight to go back that Sunday night. Uh, out of my past experiences, one of the things that gets bombed in Lebanon, the first thing that they would bomb is the airport. And once they bomb the airport, you can't go in, you cannot go out. And so um, uh, we booked, and while I was going there, I booked for my, my children because Jacob and Joy and Jenna were, were back in, this, in Lebanon. And I called him and said, I booked your flight. You're on the flight tomorrow. We, we'll, we'll cross in the air, but I wanted to get them out because I knew tickets will be uh, going expensive and everybody will be trying to leave Lebanon. And so they would not want to leave. I said, hey, I booked you a ticket. And he said, no, Dad, we have the school and we have the church and we're not going to leave. So I had to cancel the tickets until I got there. I put my foot down and said, you're leaving. <laughs> Amen. But I thank God for my family that they've been a, a, a strong support to the work of God in Lebanon. And uh, my wife and I prayed and uh, we felt like we needed to stay with our church family in Lebanon. And uh, they, they could not leave the, the country and it wouldn't be right for me as a pastor to leave. And so we sent the kids back home and my wife and I stayed there and... Uh, uh, almost on a daily basis, we were getting messages from the U.S. Embassy to leave Lebanon. Leave while you can. Leave while there is commercial flights. Flights were canceling their, their trips to Lebanon. And uh, uh, just it, and there was like a blanket of fear that has overtaken the whole country. It was so heavy. And you can tell that things were about to explode. Just like if you have a lighter, you... It just like things things were so heavy and uh, that night that night we went to church it was a Saturday night and uh, and you can feel even that spirit somehow had got into the people and got into the church we felt such a strong uh, the, the Hezbollah all of a sudden started bombing uh, northern Israel and Israel was responding about and that's about an hour and a half away from us and uh, we were concerned about the war coming into Beirut and you know we went on praying. And at times when you don't know what to do, you can pray. I want to tell you, prayer changes everything. Prayer changes everything. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. I want to tell somebody tonight. It doesn't matter what you're facing. There is a God that you can call upon. There is a God that's in control. And you can call on His name. And He will hear your prayer. And He will move. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We prayed and I said, Lord, you told Abraham that if there is 10 people, 10 righteous people, that you will spare that city. And I said, God, there is more than 10 people in this church that love you, that worship you, that they are attached to you. And God, you're able to spare our city. And can I tell you suddenly that blanket took off from our church and that spirit took off from the place and the spirit of victory start coming over us. Oh, hallelujah. And I cannot tell you, you can step outside the church and you feel darkness. You step into the church and you feel the glory of God and the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, don't you love him tonight? Don't you love God tonight? Aren't you thankful to be in church tonight? Aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what takes place. I still believe that God is in charge. I believe that God is in charge and, and God has been so good to us. So the first couple of weeks passed. And this brother from Iraq called me and he said, Pastor, I know things are tough and hard and, 
and they just bombed the, the area near, near the airport in northern Iraq because there was a U.S. base. He said, Pastor, I've witnessed a couple of families. It will be great if you and Sister Azar can come and see us. And I said, brother, this is, you know, and I thought to myself, maybe this time Iraq will be safer than Lebanon. <laughs> So I looked for flights, and, and there was no flight but one that left on Sunday morning. I said, well, there is no way I'll leave Lebanon and leave the church on Sunday morning. I prayed about it. When I prayed about it, I felt like God wanted us to go. I went back online, and at that moment, they put flights leaving on Tuesday. So we booked flights. My wife and I left Tuesday morning and uh, had a return coming on Thursday. We got there. It's about an hour and 30 minutes flight. We got to northern Iraq, and the brethren there met us. And we didn't know, you know, we didn't know it's illegal to bring Bibles into Iraq. And we, we have these Bibles that you all several years helped us print. They, they have apostolic doctrine in the front. And uh, so my wife and I took two suitcases. We're happy. And we didn't know until after we got to Iraq that it's illegal to take Bibles with you. We weren't that brave. We just <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> Amen. And so... <laughs> Amen. And so we got there, and when we got to security, they called us to search us, and they, they searched everything. They are backpacked, but these two suitcases, they didn't search. Amen. And just me. <laughs> Amen. Just like God. I don't know if they didn't see them. I saw them. They were there, but they just, oh, don't you love Jesus tonight? I want to tell you that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel such a strong anointing in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. I believe somebody can be healed tonight. I believe somebody can get the Holy Ghost tonight. Don't you feel it? Don't you feel the presence of God? Come on, love the Lord right now. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. The brethren took us to our hotel there. We got to the hotel and they, we went straight visiting these families. And I, I believe it was like midnight till we got back. And the next day, we didn't have a place. We bought a, 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 one of these small tubs. You blow up and filled it up with water and baptized seven people. And two of them received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to tell you, there was nothing like it right in the middle of Iraq, middle of a place of darkness. God is moving, washing sins away, filling people with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell somebody tonight, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name tonight, don't you leave this place. Turn your heart to God. God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We went back to Lebanon and we give God the glory. I thank the Lord. Now we have about eight people in Iraq that they're meeting together and they're praying together and they feel like God is raising a church. And this is how it all starts. Amen. I, I, I love preaching. I love teaching. But I tell you, I love Bible studies. I love to sit with people and teach them a Bible study. And I believe this is the greatest tool God gave the church. Amen. And um, and so uh, we went back to Lebanon, and uh, uh, things were still escalating. Um, and uh, early, uh, late November, uh, we, we felt like they were not going to bomb the airport. And so we uh, took a trip to Cyprus, um, and um, we, felt, we felt we'll go there for a couple of days. Cyprus is an island about 35 minutes from Lebanon. It's like almost Lebanon, but it's in Europe. And... Uh, so you go up in the plane, you come right down, and Cyprus was the only country that they had flights every day, in and out. As a matter of fact, Middle East Airline, the Lebanese Airline, moved their, their planes because they thought the airport was going to be bombed. They moved it to Cyprus. So we got there, and it happened back in September. Prior to that, my wife and I went. My wife and I were married, actually, in Cyprus. Met in Europe, married in Cyprus, moved to the States. And uh, uh, we went to that city, that city that's called Paphos. And uh, when we got there, we felt such an authority in the Holy Ghost that, that that was such an open door. And you can feel the presence of God in such. We didn't feel it in any other cities in Cyprus. But when we got there and we had someone that was very sick and had high fever, could not move from, from being feeble and sick and uh, we went and prayed for them in the name of Jesus and they were immediately healed we felt that authority <laughs> amen and so we went there and uh, God connected us with some key men and uh, had given us favor with influential people in that city 
I found out that the American University of Beirut has moved, uh, has actually not moved, opened another place in Paphos, and there was a lot of Lebanese that moved there, and we were able to connect. So we took several trips, and God is opening the door for us to plant another church in Cyprus. Amen. And, and to me, this is, this is mind-boggling because, you know, in the midst of war and chaos, God is moving, touching people's life, filling people with the Holy Ghost. And I know, I know that, that the world is going to take its course, but the church is going to take its course also. And I'm thankful tonight that I am in the church. I'm thankful tonight that I have a living God that's working and moving and planning. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we are excited about what God is going to do in Cyprus. We have located a building and uh, um, we, we believe that God is going to help us to get this building and plant a church. And this way we'll have a work in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Iraq and in Cyprus. And uh, I'm believing God. Our church has been licensed not just in Lebanon but also in Syria. We have a brother in our church that I, I'm praying, believing God that soon he will go to Damascus and uh, take this gospel and plant a church there. And I'm, I'm believing God for revival in the Middle East. I believe it. It all started there. And it's all going to end there. I, I know there are going to be wars and all, all this stuff happening. But in the middle of that, I believe God's going to be saving people. I'm filling people with the Holy Ghost, changing people's lives. We give him glory and honor tonight. And I, I cannot thank you. Thank you from all of our hearts for your prayers, for your help and support. This church has been helping us month after month. And we thank you for your prayers and for supporting us, supporting the work of God in Lebanon. And uh, I can stand here and tell you all about the Middle East. That's what's on my heart. But I, I do feel like God laid something on my spirit tonight that I want to share with you. And I want to ask you to stand with me if you would. I want to ask you if you can go with me. I want to go to two places in the scripture. Book of Exodus chapter 30 and verse 22. How many love the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Thank you Lord. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 22. We ask you to be in prayer. Jacob and Joy are supposed to go back on February 1st. And then my wife and I will be leaving toward end of February, early March. And um, we pray that God will, will continue to keep his hand on the church this morning. The brother who's in charge of the service there. I mean, I got several messages. And I know when they had good church in Lebanon, I received many messages from church family and I was so thankful that the presence of God was so strong and they had great church in Beirut today. And I thank the Lord that's helping us. Amen. Do you love Jesus tonight? Amen. Exodus 13 verse 22. Moreover the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much. Even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, and, if, and after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, a hen. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil, and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith. And the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlesticks, and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the laver and his foot, and thou shalt sanctify them, that they be most holy, and whatsoever touches them shall be holy. Amen. Isaiah 61 verse 1. Amen. The prophet was prophesying. And he said that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And he had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance to our God and comfort 
to all that mourn, and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, and to give unto them beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may, might be called trees of righteousness, and the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And with the help of the Lord, just for a little bit, I want to preach tonight about the release of the anointing. The release of the anointing. If you can please put your Bibles down and lift your hands with me toward heaven. And would you help me pray? Lord, we thank you for your presence that we feel in this place tonight. Thank you for your anointing that is in this house. We ask you, Lord, that you would minister to our minds and our hearts and our bodies. And I pray that you let your word go forth and let it do its work. God, we completely depend on you. That you would speak to the inner person tonight. And that you would have your way in this house. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Would you give the Lord a hand clap with me tonight? Let's do it one more time. Lord, you're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And please be seated. The biblical definition of an anointing is resembled in the Bible in the pouring and the smearing of oil upon a subject or a person. Amen. The first place you read about someone using oil to anoint in the Bible was Jacob. Jacob was escaping his brother Esau and he, he had problems at home and he was running for his life. He was taking a journey to meet his uncle Laban, not knowing his future, not knowing what's going to be next. And there the Bible tells us that when the evening came, he, he, he made a stop at a place called Luz and he found him a stone. He took the stone and laid it on its side and he rested and he slept there. During that night, God visited him and God spoke to him. Amen. He told him that, that he's going to be his God. He's going to help him and he's going to bring him back to the place where he's running away from. And the Bible says that, that Jacob, during that night, he saw heaven open. He saw the Lord. He saw a ladder and the Lord upon that ladder. He saw the angels descending and ascending. And when he woke up from that dream, he said, surely this is not just any place. But this is the house of God. This is where God visited me. And this is where God spoke to me. And he refused to go forward. But yet he took that stone. That stone that was merely just like any stone. But now it was a different thing about it. He took that stone. Let it stand on its side. And he took oil and anointed that place. And I want to tell you as you read throughout the scripture. From generation to generation. There always been a link to that place. This is where God visited him. This is where God visited I. Isaac and Jacob and this is where God has started moving and Israel was connected to that place simply because that place was anointed I want to tell you tonight I don't want to go through life feeling that I just visited church and this is just when God touched me but every time I feel the anointing of the Lord I gotta say you know what uh, this is the holy place this is the place of God this is the house of God this is what God spoke to me and changed me and healed me and delivered me Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible tells us that the anointing that, that was, was used in the Old Testament, uh, that God, had, when he spoke to Moses about building the altar and doing all the furniture, we all know that God is into the specific. He's into the details. He told exactly to told Moses exactly how to do the tabernacle, how to do the furniture, their size, and what they supposed to be made of, and and how beautiful everything looked. And he made the tabernacle. And the Bible tells us that after he did all the furniture, God spoke to Moses and he gave him a specific instruction about making a holy ointment a holy anointing and God told Moses amen doesn't matter it doesn't matter how beautiful things are it doesn't matter how good they are it doesn't matter how convenient the place is unless it's anointed I'm not gonna use it hallelujah there's got to be an anointing that comes on a place if God is gonna accept it 
Amen. So God tells him specifically how to do the, the clothing for Aaron and, and the priesthood. And it doesn't matter how beautiful the clothes are. Aaron had to be anointed. And the Bible tells us that Moses did that. And he took this specific, this principle pure of, of spices. And he created that oil and he started anointing everything. He anointed the tabernacle. He anointed the, the, the altars. He anointed the feet. He anointed the, the candlesticks. He anointed everything in the house of God. And unless it was anointed, God would not use it. I want to tell you tonight that there is a reason for the anointing. Amen. God had made the anointing that can take things that they are not pure and make them pure. He can take things that they are not holy and make them holy. What makes things holy is not the past, but it's the anointing. It's not the future, it's the anointing. What makes things are acceptable in the eyes of God is the anointing. Hallelujah. And so the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, not only the furniture in the tabernacle had to be anointed, but there were three offices that they had to be anointed for God to use them. You see, the anointing was not for everybody in the Old Testament. It was just for these three specific offices. Amen. The first office was the office of a prophet. If a prophet is going to be used by God, has nothing to do with his heritage. It has nothing to do with, with his talent. has nothing to do with his gifting. It had to do with the anointing. Yes. And so the Bible tells us in 1 King 19, 60, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shebat, of, of uh, Abel Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Yes. Amen. So uh, he, God had used the children of Aaron, but if God was going to use them, they still had to be anointed. Amen. And anybody that's going to speak the word of the Lord and anybody that's going to speak on behalf of God, they've got to do it under the anointing. It doesn't matter how much Bible you know. It doesn't matter how scriptures you know. It doesn't matter where you've been, what college you graduated from. Unless you're anointing, God will not accept it. It is the anointing that make God accept individuals. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that the second office that God had, that, that God commanded for anybody that's going to fulfill that office, they had to be anointed, and it's the office of a priest. All right. If a priest is going to serve in the house of God, they have to be anointed. It doesn't matter if they're cleaning. It doesn't matter if they are in the, in the, bringing the sacrifices. It doesn't matter if they're taking the tithe or the offering. It doesn't matter what they are. If they are priests in the house of God, they had to be anointed. Any service that they give, it's not accepted by God unless they are anointed. Hallelujah. God had put everything and put the weight on someone being anointed to serve him. And God does not want anybody to serve him. It doesn't matter how big the sacrifice is and how big the service is. God will not accept it unless it is anointed. It is the anointing that God is after. It is the anointing where God gives the approval. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And the, and the Bible tells us, Exodus 14 and 15, And thou shalt anoint them, that thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the office of the priest. Yeah. And the third office that had to be anointed for God to use is the office of the kings. Yeah. If you're going to be a king, you've got to be anointed. And so the Bible tells us that when God chose Saul, Saul was just an individual. But God tells Samuel in 1 Samuel 9, 16, tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel. And when God, when, when Samuel anointed Saul, the Spirit of God came upon him and he started prophesying, amen, with the other prophets. It is the anointing that made him king. Hallelujah. Not just because the people called him. It's not. It's about the office. The anointing it follows the office. And if you're going to serve God in any capacity in your life, the first thing that you have to pursue is the anointing. The anointing that qualifies. The anointing that equips. The anointing is what empowers. Oh, hallelujah. We put a lot of emphasis on people, how good they are. I want to tell you, there is nothing good about people if they are not anointed. 
they will fail they'll come short from the glory of God but you find you one person one person that has the anointing of the Holy Ghost on their life uh, and you'll see them flipping cities upside down oh hallelujah hallelujah the purpose of the anointing Exodus 29 29 and the holy garment of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated the anointing that's what the anointing said when God anoints something God is saying this is mine this is, you belong to me you buy a van for the church that's mine that's that's consecrated it's anointed it's it's for the use of the lord you you get a chair and you put it in the sanctuary it's anointing that means it's for his use you get a sound system in the back god anoints it it's for his use it's it's consecrated unto the lord oh hallelujah amen when god anoints something god's saying you belong to me hallelujah from now on your life your service, everything about you, everything you do belongs to me. I have I've given you my name. I've given you my anointing. I put you my spirit on the inside of you. You're not of the world. You're to me. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. The anointing, the second thing that the anointing does. The anointing is for sanctification. Amen. Nothing in the eyes of God is clean unless it's anointed. The anointing is what sanctifies the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 16, 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon, the, uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. That, that anointing had, had sanctified him and that anointing had equipped him. And I want to tell you, when God anoints something, God sends his Spirit, right? Not just behind it, but before it. I believe that when God anoints a person, not that, you know, it's not just that goodness and mercy follows me. I believe goodness and mercy go before me. You go to places and God just had already given you favor, given you power, given you influence. Oh, hallelujah. Because the Spirit of the Lord moves where the anointing is. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that when that anointing came, amen, upon an individual, the Spirit of God came. And David, David understood the power of something being anointed. He understood that when something is anointed, you don't mess with, you don't come against, you don't speak against, you don't even lift your arms against. Because that's the anointed of the Lord. That's why he said, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. It has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with the anointing. And when you come against somebody that's anointing, you're coming against God. Oh, hallelujah. That's one of the biggest mistakes Saul did. He came against the prophets. They were the anointed of the Lord. And you're living in a time that people are reckless in their words and their actions. And they speak about the pastor and about preachers and about this and that. And they don't understand that's not about them. It's about the office. Oh, hallelujah. People got to learn that you got to keep your mouth closed and keep your opinion to yourself. God will deal with this anointed. You just keep your spirit right. You keep your heart right. Don't you come against the anointed. Don't you come against the anointed of God. Oh, hallelujah. That's why when David, you would think he has all the right to go and kill Saul. But he said, no, no, no. You don't understand. I know he's evil. I know he killed the prophets. I know he's wicked. I know he's, amen. In the eyes of the world, he's justified to kill them, but not in the eyes of God. He said, this is God's anointing. God forbid that I, I do something and hurt him. Oh, hallelujah. When you understand the power of anointing, you respect it. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us when the anointing came, it equipped David that when Saul had an evil spirit, it wasn't his good talent and his gifting in music that made the evil spirit leave. But it was the anointing. Why? Because David knew how to release the anointing. Amen. He just, anytime there was evil things happening, you know what he did? He took that instrument and he started playing with his fingers until the anointing started flowing. And the anointing drove away the bad spirit. 
Can I tell you something tonight? I tell our church it doesn't matter about how many songs we sing. You can sing one song as long as the Holy Ghost is moving. You keep that song going. You keep that anointing flowing. It's not about performance. It's not about, I want God, if I do a program, I want God to anoint it. If I'm going to sing a song, I want God to anoint it. If I'm going to play an instrument, I want God to anoint it. If I'm going to take an offering, I want God to anoint it. Oh, hallelujah. If I'm going to usher, I, gotta, I need God to anoint me. Isn't it something people can walk into the church and you could be at the front door and the anointing is upon you and you just go and shake their hands and people feel God and they feel the presence of the Lord. I want to tell you what the world needs. The world needs to feel more of God's anointed. Something about you. that When you walk in the anointing of the Holy Ghost that you affect everything around you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so these were the only three offices in the Old Testament that they were anointed. Nobody else. Nobody else from the people could be anointed. It wasn't their place. Until, until, because the flesh, amen, God had problem with the flesh. Until God was manifested in the flesh. Amen. Something happened. When God was manifested in the flesh... I believe the anointing came upon that flesh. And the Bible says that God was manifested in the flesh and he was justified in the spirit. I believe the anointing justified the flesh. It's the spirit of God that said, you know what? This flesh is acceptable. I can use this flesh right now. I'm going to put my anointing upon it. Now we believe in one God. Uh, what we believe that God who is a spirit uh, was manifested in the flesh. Uh, and when we see Jesus Christ, uh, we're looking at the man Christ Jesus. Uh, he was a man walking in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 I want to tell you right now, uh, it wasn't just God doing the work, uh, but it was the anointing doing the work. The Bible tells us that God anointed Christ Jesus. That he went about doing good and healing all that were sick. He wouldn't even do good if he wasn't anointed. So I just want to go and help people. Don't you go and help them until you are anointed. Oh, hallelujah. I'm, I want to I preach. I want to tell you something tonight. It makes all the difference. Amen. The Bible tells us that's why when we read in Luke 4, Jesus stood in the synagogue and he opened the book of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, I feel the Holy Ghost. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me. Amen. To heal the broken heart. He has sent me to open the blind eyes. He has sent me to set the captive free. He anointed me to do that. And every time Jesus walked in the streets of Jerusalem, he walked in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Every time Jesus did a miracle, he did it under the anointing. Every time he opened the blind eyes, it was the anointing, it was the flesh. God using this flesh, this carnal flesh, that God had anointed it. And every time Jesus would go into a place, that anointing would flow. It is the anointing that made evil spirit uh, flee. It's the anointing that the devil were afraid of him. They saw this is the anointed of the Lord. I want to tell you something tonight. The devil is afraid from God's anointed. Can I tell you? Can I, can I preach to you tonight? God is... Hallelujah. When God anoints somebody, he gives them that power. He gives them that authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that when Jesus would walk and that woman, that woman of, 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 of infirmity for 18 years, I tell you how she got healed. The Bible says, Jesus said, the power left me. You know why? It's not about just touching his robe. It's not about touching his leg. She touched the anointing. And when you touch that anointing, healings flow. I believe you can be healed tonight. I believe God will take your infirmity tonight. I believe God will take that disease tonight. I believe God can heal you tonight. If you just go and touch that anointing. Oh, hallelujah. 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 In every ministry that the Lord made, He made it under the anointing. That was God's plan. That's what, that's what God was after. Hallelujah. 
But the anointing was all in the man Christ Jesus. That's why in Luke 24, when Jesus came to his disciple, he said, this is what I want. I'm going to die on the third day. I'm going to rose again. And you're going to go and preach the gospel. But don't you go and preach the gospel until you receive the promise of the Father. Don't you go and do anything unless you're anointed. Oh, hallelujah. Don't you go and give any Bible study until you're anointed. Don't you go and do anything for God until you're anointed. Because if you're going to have results in your life, you got to be anointed. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that they got into that upper room. Amen. And I believe that's why. That's why Jesus had to go through the garden of oil. Of olive trees. That's why he had to cry and tears has to. And sweat has to come be mixed with blood. It was a pressing place. That's why he had to go and, and suffer a little bitterness. They, 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 could, they, they took some. 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 Uh, vinegar and try to put it in his mouth so he can taste bitterness hallelujah and that's why he in, in the middle of all of that uh, amen the presence of God was still with him until amen he was hanging on the cross and he cried out father why did you forsake me he had to get into a place but when he was on the cross and when he died something happened and what happened was the anointing flew from Calvary to the upper room Something happened when, when he was body was broken after he went into a place of bitterness, a place of, of press, a place of, of tiredness, of beating. Something happened. He allowed that oil to break. Amen. Hallelujah. And when they were all in the upper room, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And can I tell you what happened? Every single one of them, 120 pastors, they all were anointed with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. Now they're not running for their life. They're not afraid. They can stand in the face of people who crucified Christ and said, Hey, you crucified the Messiah. And they can preach Acts 2.38 under the anointing. We wonder sometimes, how is it that 3,000 were baptized? Can I tell you how? It was the anointing. You wonder how people walked and they would put the sick people on the streets. And when Peter and, and the disciples who passed from their shadow, they were healed. Do you know why? It's because of the anointing. It was not because of the shadow. It has to do with the anointing. They were so close from the anointing that the anointing would touch them and heal them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's what Jesus did. That's exactly what he did. He said, I'm going to take that anointing and I'm going to anoint my church. When I put my name, I'm going to anoint my church. And I'm going to pour that oil upon it. Oh, hallelujah. That's why the book of Revelation tells us that to him who had washed us from our sins. And he had made us kings and priests. Do you know how he made us to fit in these offices of the Old Testament? By the anointing. When you were filled with the Holy Ghost, God had anointed you. God had made the priest out of you. He made the prophet. He made the king. You tell me, Pastor, I'm not much how you, you, the devil's been lying to you. God had put his spirit on the inside of you. God has anointed you. God had touched your heart. God had touched your life. And everywhere you walk, you can go to India, you can go to Lebanon. Everywhere you walk, that anointing. You're walking and people feel something different about you. They want to know why. Can I tell you why? It's the anointing. Can I tell you what the world needs? The world needs the anointing. They need anointed people that they can walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And that's what we do. That's been the key for us, at least in Lebanon. Tell me, how, how is it that people walk off the streets? And they weep and cry. Muslim, Muslim people weep in the presence of God. Do you know why? It has nothing to do with anything that we do. It has to do with the anointing. I've learned that if we have enough prayer in our church and prayer in our home and prayer in our life until we're bubbling, until that anointing is flowing, it's not just about praying, it's about praying in the Holy Ghost. It's not just about worship, it's about worshiping in the Holy Ghost. It's not just about praising, it's praising with the Holy Ghost. And whatever I got to do, I got to do it until I'm flowing with the anointing. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I used to go to work. And I used to have so many problems at my job. Just evil spirit everywhere. And can I tell you, I started going to work early. And I started praying. And I started praying until I pray in tongues. And something has shifted in that place. People would walk and don't know what's happening. But everybody's attitude has changed. Can I tell you why? Because it's the anointing that makes spirit flee. And don't you tell me I'm in a hard place. I'm in a dry place. I'm working in a difficult place. I have so much witchcraft in my city. That's not true. If you allow the Holy Ghost and the anointing to flow, it'll drive every evil spirit. It'll drive every wickedness. It'll give you revival in your home. Give you revival in your family. Give you revival in your job. Oh, hallelujah. If you stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. He anointed them and he made them priests. Now I'm looking at a group of people tonight that has been called to serve God in the kingdom. Different capacity under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He made you kings over your home, your family. Amen. That you can walk in that anointing. God is so much after the anointing and the release of it that sometimes, you know what I've seen God do sometimes? People that really just want to stay where they're at. People who did not understand that it's all about the release of the anointing. I've seen God sometimes take them to that garden of olive, put them in a place of pressing, a place of hardship. Hallelujah. There they have to take a little bit and try to start tasting a little bitterness. They hurt. Something happens to them. They don't know why. They got broken in their minds, in their spirits. Something happens. You don't understand why, but yet God takes a little bitterness and take a little cinnamon, a little sweet and bring it together right in that pressing place. And all of a sudden you look at their life something has happened into them their prayer life has changed their walk with God has changed do you know why because they've been broken into a place where now they come to God and, and all what they can do is pray a little bit and a little bit of that anointing will start flowing and you walk around them and you feel something about them have you ever been around some folks that's been broken they might walk with a hip injury but yet the anointing flow through them and this 2024 I don't want to just live it like 2023 but this year I want to walk in the anointing of the Holy Ghost I want God to take me to that place that I am so full of the Holy Ghost. I'm so full of prayer, so full of worship, so full of the anointing that everywhere I go, that's what people see and that's what people feel. And if you want this tonight for that holy ointment to flow and that anointing to flow, I want to invite you to come to this altar that you would open your heart and open your spirit and allow that Holy Ghost anointing to flow and to flow and to flow hallelujah you're asking God for a blessing you're asking God for miracles you ought to be asking God for that anointing anoint me God anoint my fingers anoint my heart anoint my legs anoint my mind anoint my thoughts and right now as you pray the Holy Ghost is going to flow in this altar and I just want you to lift up your heart and lift up your hands and start praying and pray until you pray in tongues pray until you feel that overflow Jesus anointing that's it fall on me let the power of the Holy Ghost
that anointing in your life tonight, would you just surrender your heart to the Lord? God, we've got to have more of your anointing. We've got to have your power, Lord. God, we can't win this city by ourselves. We can't make an impact in this region by ourselves, Lord. We can't win this world by ourselves. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, me. 
thank the Lord for his word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing that was on the preacher tonight. Thank you for the anointing that's on your word, Lord. I believe I'm standing in an anointed church tonight. Would you thank him for his anointing? And the power of the Holy Ghost. I wonder how many of you would help me right now give thanks to the Lord for Brother Azar and the word of the Lord that we heard tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just wonder by the show of hands in this room tonight, how many of you will commit that in 2024 you're going to hold the Azars up before the Lord? We're going to pray for them. We're going to believe God for them. Amen. If you're not following, if you're not following their ministry on social media, I want you to follow after them. I want you to see what God's doing. Um, not to put them on the spot, but how, how many students do you have, Sister Azar at Cedars? 50 students in a one God apostolic Jesus name Christian school. Do you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you go, the enemy's going to fight you and he's going to battle against the good that you're doing. But it's an encouragement to know that no matter where we're fighting, we've got an army standing behind us. Amen. People can believe whatever they want to believe, and they probably will. But I'm going to tell you what this preacher here believes tonight. I believe that God has a way of just blinding the eyes that he don't want to see and opening the eyes that he wants to see. I can tell you right now that some would say it was just a coincidence that the security guards got tired of looking and searching. You know what I believe? I believe the old angel of the Lord just stood right there in front of them Bibles. And I'm going to tell you what else. I've never had this happen to me anywhere I went in the world. But I shared this. They probably don't even remember this. But I was in this church praying before I left to go to Beirut. And that was, I want to say 2015, something like that, that I was there. I was praying, and uh, I had a couple people ask me. Of course, we didn't know really as much as we, we know now. They had not lived there as long. And they said, are you, really, are you really going to the Middle East to preach? Like, you're going to go have church there? And uh, so I was in this church praying for that meeting, praying for the Azars. And I saw, I'd never been to the airport in Beirut, Lebanon. I'd never been there in my life. I'd never been to the city. But I saw the airport in Beirut before I ever left there in, in this church. I was praying. And I saw myself standing out. I, from where I was looking, I was standing out kind of in the open area by the gate where I was coming off the airplane. And I saw these two mighty men. They were mighty angels that walked off of that jetway and I walked off right behind them and the Lord said, you go and know that I've sent my angels with you. I'm going to tell you, there is an apostolic anointing. We heard it tonight. But there is apostolic anointing that's been released in the Middle East. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. We've only seen the beginning of what God's going to do. There is an apostolic anointing on this couple and we thank the Lord for them. Amen. And I believe, I believe that the Azars are going to drive every devil in that region crazy doing the will of God. Don't we love Brother and Sister Azar and Janet? It's so good to have you with us. Thank the Lord. Uh, shake hands. Be friendly tonight. Please, please be in prayer this week. Tomorrow, for those of you that are free, Sister Ruth Stennett's funeral is tomorrow at noon at Brown Butts Deidre Funeral Home. We'll be there for that, but uh, go in the power of the Lord, be in prayer this week. Please greet one another in Jesus' name.